The International News Net World Report is a national television news show available in more than 30 million homes. We broadcast daily real news the networks won't tell you. We are solely viewer supported. That means you. You can donate at our website, innworldreport.net. We hope you find the following interview informative and helpful. We're joined with Brendan Fitzgerald, who is the co-director with his brother of The Ballad of Ischiel Hernandez, which premieres at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, Brendan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now, now, Brendan, first tell us what this movie's all about. Who is Ischiel Hernandez? Ischiel Hernandez was an 18-year-old uh, American high school student uh, from a small town of Redford, Texas, on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, it's about uh, a couple hours south of El Paso on the border. And um, he uh, was a, a, a high school student, as I said, and um, uh, took care of his family's goats, uh, wanted to be a Marine, and um, unfortunately had an encounter with a team of U.S. Marines on the border doing drug surveillance, and uh, they took his life. Now, this, of course, occurs in the context of uh, many years, several decades, in fact, of permutations of the war on drugs. Give us a little context, because this is a fascinating story. Why did this team of Marines wind up down there in uh, that county on the border with Mexico? Well, the war on drugs uh, really began in the 1980s. And, uh, but you didn't actually see armed military patrols until 1989. Uh, and it was George Bush Sr. who really supported the program to get armed military on the border to do uh, drug interdiction missions. And so for about eight years until this incident happened, you had uh, a number of uh, thousands, in fact, of missions uh, along the border. They were covert. Uh, the Marines who went out there, they'd usually go out in teams of three or four, uh, look at a uh, suspected area of drug trafficking uh, with binoculars at night, and uh, they would call in what they saw through the Border Patrol. And uh, this went on for a, a period of a number of years until this incident happened, uh, at which point the military patrols, the armed military patrols were suspended. And uh, we really haven't seen the same kind of um, military presence along the border since uh, really until today, until last year of the National Guard coming down back to the border. Now, uh, what, and what year was Ezekiel killed? 1997. It was May 20th, 1997. One of the interesting things about this is the issue of uh, who's right about drug trafficking and, and whatnot. We know, of course, that in many poor communities of the United States, uh, trafficking in drugs uh, given the nature of, of unemployment, et cetera, is a, is a necessity. Uh, and again, I don't know the specifics of the county down there in Texas, but according to your film, you quote a source that said that about 60 to 70 percent of the people down in that area were involved in the illicit trafficking of drugs, with, of course, the irony on top of that, that the sheriff of the county gets arrested later, uh, you should talk about in the film, uh, for being a coke smuggler. Um, and busted and I guess put in prison for life. So tell us a little bit about that aspect of it. What, what did you, how, how did you make sense of what was really happening down there? Well, the drug trade on the border is a very complicated business and it involves people on, on both sides of the border. Um, lo the local authorities are uh, almost complicit in, in, in this whole activity and understand that this is a necessary part of, of the economy on the border. Um, and to a large extent, uh, the, tr the drug trafficking that does go on comes through the, the legal ports of entry uh, that doesn't come through generally mule teams in the desert. That's not the way drugs generally come through uh, in, into the United States. So we, we try to deal with the film um, in, with, a, with a huge issue, which is the drug trafficking issue, um, with a very small example of, of a sheriff in, in this county, Presidio County in West Texas, 
who was in fact the largest drug dealer in the county's history and was caught at the port of entry uh, in Presidio with uh, 1.2 tons of cocaine, I believe, uh, with a street value of a billion dollars. And so it, it just kind of illustrates the, 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 the complexity of the, of the drug trafficking industry down there and the, the almost absurd use of the military in, in places along the desert where virtually no trafficking occurs. Mm-hmm. or no trafficking to, to any significant extent. Now, obviously, since 911 and the whole notion of our unprotected borders, both, both with Canada and Mexico, there obviously is an increase in uh, the surveillance of the borders in these ways. Uh, and, of course, the immigration issue comes into the picture, too, with the building of walls in different parts of the country and a uh, increase in resources uh, for that purpose. And what was ironic in looking at the film was how, you know, you talked about how people have family on the other side, that, you know, the relations between the uh, communities on each side of the border are traditional and historical and complicated and uh, not easily uh, dealt with by such harsh methods as, as closing the border precipitously. And just give us a sense of how you dealt with, how you perceive the feeling of people down there in Texas about all that. Well, shortly after after 9-11 occurred, they began closing down what are called Class D ports of entry, which are basically uh, a guy in a rowboat um, who would would row family members back and forth because everybody on the border, uh, border essentially in that part of the of the world is a river, and it's a river that you can walk across, you can drive across, you can ride a horse across. And so traditionally, people would go across and visit their uncle or grandfather on the other side of the river on uh, a Sunday. And uh, they've been doing that for centuries. And um, shortly after 9-11, they, they, they started to close these, these uh, ports of entry down. And it's, it's an enormous hassle for people to have to go 60, 70, 80 miles out of their way just to go see their, 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 their family members 100 yards away across the border. And uh, so it's it's been an enormous disruption in people's lives, and for the most part, there are hardworking, humble, and um, honest, decent people living on the border, and uh, uh, they've been caught up in a, in a world that uh, that they can they have no real knowledge of, uh, and under the control of policymakers who know nothing about life on the border. So it's a very complicated uh, issue for them as well, and and. Um, and they're feeling that they that they are under surveillance now again. Right. Well, right. Well, you, and in the film, you have uh, very powerful uh, examples of how distant people are from this. You know, you you were showing on Capitol Hill uh, elected officials commenting on what they thought went on down there uh, in the incident that led to um, Ezekiel's death. Uh, but talk more about that. You know, here you have this young kid who uh, seemed like a really decent young kid. Uh, wanted to be a Marine, uh, is sitting there one day taking a 22 because he's afraid dogs might interfere with his goat herd and walks down to, uh, walks down towards the, the Rio Grande, I guess, and then sees, uh, four, four, or, or may have seen, uh, four, uh, figures in the distance that looked to him like animals. Tell us what happened there. Well, sadly, we will never know what, uh, he thought that he saw. Uh, on that unfortunate day, but uh, whatever it was, it was certainly not a team of, of four U.S. Marines in ghillie suits, uh, fully camouflaged with rifles. Um, the way people live down there, they they take care of their goats. They there's a it's a very remote part of the world. Uh, there's a lot of space. They he was in his backyard.